Hello. Hi. Hi, are you uh, Ryan? I am, yes. Hi, I'm Stuart. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Awesome. Great to see you. Yeah. So, yeah, Sam said you were doing it tonight. Mm hmm. Good. We'll wait a couple more minutes for people to. Sign yeah, up. there's usually uh, Deborah usually comes, and then um, there's a third, another woman that comes. Some of the time. Sounds good. You just been with uh, stargazing just this year? This is my third summer with Wyoming oh. stargazing. Yep. And what about in the winter? Where are you? So the last two winters I spent in Florida. I was finishing up my master's. Um, but I just graduated uh, this past spring. So now I have the winter time to do what I want. Great. Where did you graduate from? Uh, I went to Florida Tech in Melbourne. Uh huh. Cool. Great. If nobody else shows up, uh, I guess we'll get going at like five after. Yeah, that sounds good. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, he's generally been very good. But I don't think Sam Samuel's had really pushed any advertising. 
sure it was advertised some people. Right. Yeah, I think we just have this uh, posted on our website. Yeah, that's the only place. It's, that's it. So nobody. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. obscure. Are you familiar with this movie? Yeah, I watched it about 10 days ago. Oh, sweet. Nice. And I probably watched it, I think I, think I probably watched it when it came out. But. So it was good. Yeah, I mean, it was really, it was a great movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found it pretty entertaining. It seems like it was a uh, um, movie made out of Star Trek. Yeah, it was kind of like a a play on Star Trek, right? Yes, yeah. And apparently, uh, both captains. Uh, um, you know, uh, William Shatner, I guess he played Kirk, and then I'm blocking the guy that played the other guy, Picard. Mm -hmm. He was the other Star Trek commander. They both had comments after this came out. So. Right, okay. Really interesting. Well, it's 6.05 right now. Yeah, I think we could just go. Yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. So we're looking at Galaxy Quest. And what I wanted to present first was the trailer for the movie. And I picked up on a couple things that I think are worth explaining here. Um, so it's just a couple minutes. So the first thing that I mentioned um, was that this takes place 8 million light years away from Earth. And so immediately when you hear that, um, 8 million light years is the distance that light can travel in 8 million years. And um, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Nothing can travel at the speed of light. And even if you know, these characters could, you probably wouldn't be able to fit it into uh, a movie. Um, so the way they got around this was, um, it looked like, I'll go back here. This was just barely um, shown in wormhole. the clip. Yeah, the wormhole. So when he gets like sent back to Earth from the spaceship, he goes through this gigantic funnel looking structure and now the reason you can get away with this is wormholes don't violate any laws of physics you know they're not prohibited by einstein's theory of relativity you're not breaking any barriers you know the law states that no information can travel from one place to the other faster than light but nothing is stopping a, a particle or some matter from having, you know, being one, in one space in the universe and then tunneling through it. So like you're bending space and, you know, a good way to 
imagine this is you have a piece of paper and you have an ant at one end of the paper. And surely the ant cannot travel by itself from one edge to the other instantaneously. Um, but what you can do is you can fold the paper onto itself and the ant only has to take one step and it finds itself all the way on the other side. And that's what wormholes would be doing, you know, if they were, you know, proven to be real things in our universe. And I really like this clip that um, explains wormholes, um, albeit they are entirely hypothetical. So we'll give this a, a watch. So I'm just going to pause it really quickly and just explain explain briefly what the first kind of uh, wormhole was. And so these are ones that are thought to exist 
or that could possibly exist in the center of a, in a real black hole. And if we go back to um, this little clip here, this does kind of look like a black hole in real life. It's got somewhat of an accretion disk, and it looks like it's drawing matter from what looks like a nearby star. So it looks like in this case, we'd be talking about the first kind of black hole. The only problem with that is, as was just mentioned in the video, it's impossible to traverse to the other side. No matter is going to, you know, no person is going to make it out alive to the other end. Um, and it would take far too long to just be um, back in your living room, you know, in the same minute. So um, we'll look at the second one over here. Yeah, I guess the first one is still, uh, I mean, up till now there was this feeling you couldn't even get information out of it. It all disappears. And um, Stephen Hawking, before he died, you know, seemed to concede that it's possible that information could come out, but it's all coming out of the same side. It's not, I don't think it's coming through it. Right. Yeah. And so what Stephen Hawking was describing was it like Hawking radiation? Is it necessarily matter from inside the black hole coming out? Um, it's a little bit um, more complicated. So if I remember correctly, Hawking radiation is when two um, particles, um, they kind of just like pop into existence and then annihilate each other. They pop into existence and annihilate each other. And the, uh, the tidal forces from the black hole are able to strip the companion away from that other particle and the particle just kind of leaves and the other one gets sucked in. So it's sort of like matter just popping into existence then destroying itself, but before they get a chance to annihilate, one falls in the black hole and one, you know, flies away. And it well, looks this is like, as if- Like it's quantum, qu with quantum entanglement and yeah, having the two particles and one of them's falling into the black hole. Right. Yeah, and so what it seems like is that the, the black hole is like radiating out some sort of energy, but it's not quite like that. Got it. So here's the, um, here's the second kind of wormhole. One of its variations is the correct description of our universe, but then we could be lucky and our universe might even have a tangled web of countless wormholes already. Shortly after the Big Bang, quantum fluctuations in the universe and the smaller scales, far, far smaller than an atom, may have created many, many traversable wormholes. Threaded through them are strings called cosmic strings. In the first millionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, the ends of these tiny, tiny wormholes are pulled by cheers and heart, scattering them through the universe. In a wormhole made in the early universe, whether with cosmic strings or some other way, they could be all over, just waiting to be discovered. One might even be closer than we realize. From the outside, black holes and wormholes can look very similar, leading some physicists to suggest the superman as if black holes in the center of galaxies are actually wormholes. It will be very hard to go all the way to the center of the Milky Way to find out, though, but that's okay. There might be an equally extremely hard way to get our hands on wormhole. We can try to make one. So, second kind is pretty straightforward. It's um, sort of like the ant example. Where you're walking on a piece of paper and you just fold the piece of paper so that they're meeting. And that little tunnel that connects one side to the other is a cosmic string. So um, if I were asked, you know, what did, um, what did Jason go through to get back to his house? Um, I would think it's some sort of traversable wormhole where you kind of just enter and, and instantly pop out to wherever you were previously. Although cosmic strings at least in string theory are are very minuscule 
smaller than exponentially smaller they're like near the plank length or something so how does yeah, that allow exactly. people to go through yeah so it, it would be kind of so that is a good point um it would be kind of tricky to imagine sending you know a human-sized object through one of these wormholes mm -hmm. if the diameter of that tube is on the order of you know 10 to the minus what is it 35 meters yeah right because even if you were broken down to your individual atoms, you'd be far too big to slip through the hole. Right. So now let's go to man-made wormholes. To be traversable and useful, there are a few properties we want a wormhole to have. Most obviously connects to distance of space-time. So there's, you know, a lot of uh, answers uh, or questions to be answered when it comes to um, thinking about black uh, wormholes. One thing that uh, I just thought of now was when they mentioned exotic matter. Um, I wonder if, you know, there could be such a thing and then it would kind of create the symmetry between the gravitational force and the electromagnetic force because with ENM you do have positive charges and negative charges with gravity even though the equations for the forces are pretty much the same gravity is only attractive you never have masses or, or you never have matter uh, repelling one another
So it'd be interesting to like try to fit that and try to fit gravity into the standard model. Yeah, I mean, it's like the only repelling force we're kind of thinking about is dark energy that we don't really understand. But mm -hmm. I think dark matter and exotic matter that was portrayed in that cartoon are probably different things, but who knows? This is all bordering on. Right, yeah, Sorry. they're totally, totally unknown entities, dark matter and dark energy. And, you know, somehow when he was pulling into that man-made wormhole's quantum vacuum fluctuation. You know, again, back to Hawking, I think he was using that to try and explain how the universe even started, how you can get something from nothing. And he seemed to say yeah. quantum vacuum fluctuations or something like that. Mm -hmm. but, pretty uh, esoter esoteric stuff. Definitely. So I have the, the video up here. Um, there's another part of it that I want to examine. So here they're coming into land on this planet here. Let me just actually speak to that. Book. What's my last name? So right away, it looks like he's just taking a gamble on opening the hatch, just hoping that they're able to breathe whatever is on that planet, yeah. if there is breathable anything. So I don't see anything here. You still have it left on the, you're not sharing the screen on this. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I got to, whoops. Move to the. Yeah, let me get a new share. This is it. Sorry about that. No problem. You see it now? Yeah. Okay. You have a screen within a screen now, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I forgot this is in a new window. So even, um, even if there was oxygen on this planet, if it wasn't the exact um, mixture, concentration, mixture. so as much as we have at sea level, you'd probably have difficulty breathing. I'm sure if you placed me at even 10,000 feet of elevation, I'd be probably gasping for breath um, because there's just that much less oxygen um, you know, at that elevation. So it's just kind of funny that this is perfect conditions mm. for people to walk around and breathe. Not only that, the gravity looks to be uh, pretty identical to what it would be on Earth because they're, they're walking around, um, you know, pretty normally. I did some research on where this is actually taking place I'll skip to over here so you can get a better look at the landscape. Um, so what's interesting is go back to over here, 
my presentation. Oops. Oh, I guess I should have screen. It's like a little bar. Oh, Google Slides. Okay. So here it is. This is where they filmed the movie, and it's in Utah. This is Goblin Valley. Um, so it's got this like red, almost Martian type terrain. And I think Sam had um, done a bit about this um, for another movie um, that took place on Mars. And I would assume John, that they, John, John Carter. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so Utah obviously has the very famous red uh, landscape um, from the um, hematite that is like the iron minerals in the rocks. And so it kind of looks otherworldly. Um, so I thought that was uh, pretty interesting. Um, I, I think one of the ways they can kind of get away with this, you know, it's just, I mean, the, the whole thing was like a spoof and they were really actors on the stage and it's almost as if, you know, they assume that this was just one more stage they just open up and, you know, it's going to have perfect gravity. Right. Just, you know. So it's kind of like a spoof on a spoof in a way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> um, I'm going to go back here real quick uh, to the trailer. And I'm going to pick up on one more thing. Okay, so I think it was right over here. So you kind of heard this like missile being shot from the, the spaceship and then upon impact this gigantic explosion. And I think this is probably one of the most um, critiqued elements of sci-fi space films is that there isn't any sound in space, right? Because Sound requires a medium to travel. Um, they're compression waves, essentially. And if space is just a vacuum, sound um, cannot physically travel through it. Um, but there is uh, a pretty cool thing that astronomers have detected. Um, there can technically, you can technically hear some things in space but they're not normal sound as we would um, hear regularly. Um, they're electromagnetic waves. Uh, in this case, or in this example, I'm gonna show you what NASA had picked up. Um, was it NASA? I think so, from, from Jupiter. So Jupiter, um, I think this was discovered a couple decades ago. And the thing I'm gonna pull up is from 2016. Jupiter emits uh, radio wave pulses. And over the course of a few days, I think, uh, they had picked up these radio waves and translated it into audio, something that you could hear. And I think it's pretty neat to keep a listen to. 
me find where I put it here. Yes, Juno. Right, the satellite. So, the satellite. Right. Mm -hmm. So this was taken over the course of uh, several days and they condensed it into like a minute long clip. And so here's basically what Jupiter sounds like if you could detect radio waves with your, with your ears. It's kind of a eerie, but also a beautiful sound uh, coming from Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there are other sound clips from different objects. I think there's a video out there um, that translates uh, electromagnetic signals from the sun into audible sound. Um, <clears throat> but you kind of just have to like uh, be very judicious when searching these things because people like to just put their own sound overlaid on top of it and uh, it's really not true. Um, so I'm, I'm missing the basic concept. How do they go from the electromagnetic signal to a sound? Um, so light and sound are both waves. And mm -hmm. light comes in many different forms. Visible, right. visible is the one that we can see, and also UV radio, et cetera. And the radio waves that are coming off of Jupiter um, have a frequency of, you know, so many, let me think, I think it's kilohertz. Um, I don't remember what the order of magnitude is, but um, you can then map that frequency of light to a frequency of sound. And so you're basically hearing the pulses of light. Um, you're kind of just translating light into sound. They're both mm -hmm. waves with peaks and troughs, um, you know, a particular frequency. Um, and then, yeah, we create a sound with a matching frequency of that light. Well, I guess when SETI, when, what is SETI using? Are they using electromagnetic waves when they're searching, you know, for... I, I would imagine um, just because the the spectrum of electromagnetic electromagnetic radiation is much broader than audible sound, so humans can only detect sounds from twenty to twenty thousand hertz, but um, light comes in a wider um, spread of frequencies. Do you remember at the beginning of the movie Contact when uh, the actual sound was coming in and that Jodie Foster was, they were hearing it too. So I'm wondering if they use the same kind of mapping that you're talking about. Probably, yes. Yeah, that sounds plausible. Um, so like when we do any observation in the universe, primarily for the majority, we're looking for um, light, electromagnetic radiation. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that's why we have lots of different telescopes. We have optical telescopes, but we also have UV, microwave, radio telescopes, right. and right. we even have instruments to detect gamma and X-ray bursts from very um, distant objects like quasars. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wanted to share, and it does have to do a little bit with SETI, um, is, you know, what, what's the probability that humans could encounter another intelligent species um, you know, within the time that we're here on Earth. Um, since space is so enormous, right, um, the farthest we've ever sent a human artifact is just beyond the solar system. And the solar system is a tiny speck in the Milky Way galaxy. And just to give you an idea, um, actually, where's the, so the sun isn't even visible at, at this scale. Um, <clears throat> And so the farthest we've even sent something, forget um, communicating or uh, the distance of humans have traveled, um, is not even close to what's, to what's out there. And it goes back to like the Fermi paradox, um, which is if there's such a high probability for living things to exist in the universe, given the number of stars in a galaxy, how long it takes for um, planets to form around a star, and how many galaxies there are in the universe, why haven't we been able to communicate with some other being? Um, but an interesting factor to consider is how long the universe has been around and how long humans have been around. Um, humans have walked the earth since something like 50 to 100,000 years ago. But the universe itself has been around for 14 billion years. And it's not even close to a substantial fraction of that timeline. You know, we constitute basically nothing in the timeline of the universe. And that's just humans as a whole. You then divide that into how long we have been searching for extraterrestrials. And that's been just a handful of decades. Um, I feel like we haven't given nearly enough time to let something, uh, call us back. Well, if there's nobody out there, as Carl Sagan would say, it's a waste of a lot of space. Yes. <laughs> I, I agree. Um, but I just feel like you know, we haven't even lasted uh, a second on on Earth since since Earth has been around. Um, I like this video uh, by the same so the same channel. Um, kind of gives you a perspective of how long we have been around compared to the rest of the universe. So we'll, we'll watch this really quickly. Century 
still Thank <laughs> you. 
becomes impossible. The death of the sun four billion years later marks the end of the solar system. Okay, so no more solar system. And what happens after that? A few trillion years from now, star production will cease. And one day, the last star in the universe will die. The universe will turn dark, inhabited only by black holes. Long after the last black hole has evaporated, our universe reaches its final stage, something called heat death. Nothing changes anymore. The universe is dead. Forever. Now, you're feeling some pretty weird feelings right now, aren't you? We are too. It's only so natural. The good news is, this is all far, far away. The only time that actually matters is now. So it kind of gives you perspective just how long we have existed in the timeline of the universe is pretty much zero. Uh, we don't really constitute anything um, in terms of the, the lifespan of the universe. So yeah, the universe may be incredibly big and full of complex organisms, even intelligent enough to communicate with us. But I just feel like there isn't enough time, even if we had been around for a million more years, uh, for us to make any communication with something like that. Yeah. I mean, um, you're right. There might be. The Fermi paradox is still well stated, and uh, your answer is certainly one possible solution. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's why it's called a paradox. There really isn't any uh, reasonable resolution for it. Yeah, we're back to Stephen Hawking's again. He's on my mind who said, you better stop telling people, you know, letting know that we're here because people that come, beings that come are going to be much more powerful potentially and might not like us, but who knows? You know, I still, I still think there is reason to um, go out and explore and try to find um, whatever we can. And when I give stargazing tours out in the park, oftentimes I'm asked the question, Ryan, do you believe in aliens? And I say, of course I do. And I believe they exist right here on Earth. If you think about um, just how little of the ocean we've explored. More people have walked on the moon than have been two kilometers below the ocean surface. And it's believed something like 99% of all living things in the water have yet to be discovered. And that to me is, is alien life. It's interesting. I never thought about it that way. <clears throat> uh, you know, back. the other thing why you're thinking of the next one is, you know, they only, there's a book that just came out. Um, called The End of Everything, but, you know, there was a cosmologist that actually went and interviewed a large number of top uh, cosmologists around the world as she wrote it, but, you know, I think that the heat death, as she, you know, is pointed out in that cartoon is one way, but, you know, there's still the idea it could be the big crunch or it could be, you know, there's a change in the Six, somehow the universe, the big rip, you know, a change in the constants. We have six or eight constants that 
large number of countries, I think, that we are, seem arbitrary, but allow us to exist here. And if any of those values change for any reason, you know, that's certainly the end of us, the end of the universe as we know it. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. That's exactly it. Exactly mm -hmm. the book. Yeah, um, there are several proposed theories about what happens later on with the universe. Um, you know, you study cosmology. Uh, <laughs> what's, you know, if it's going to keep expanding. Is it going to accelerate? Um, is, the, is the expansion going to accelerate or is it going to, you know, close back in on itself? And I think an interesting uh, theory that was proposed is when you do have maximum entropy and there really is nothing left of the universe, nothing can happen. Perhaps that's when we have a new big bang, something right. coming from nothing. And mm -hmm. perhaps the universe could be uh, cyclic in that way. Yeah, it does seem like the idea of multiple, the multiverse seems at least theoretically considered, you know, it was a sci-fi idea 100 years ago or 80 years ago, and now it's considered by most, you know, sophisticated university graduate programs as, as possible. Yeah. Yeah, you just, did you get your degree from a, was it in uh, cosmology or astronomy or anything? Yeah, my, my bachelor's is in astrophysics. Mm -hmm. So I took, I took a course on cosmology and I took a course on principles of astrophysics. And that's where we were like deriving Friedman equations, calculating mm -hmm. energy density mm -hmm. of specific universes. Right, and they touched on the multiverse, right, in parallel universes. So um, I'm not sure if we dove too deep into that realm. Um, we kind of just did, did things that were um, experimental. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, parallel multiverse is not, it's more theoretical, you're right. There's no, there's no data. It's like string theory. There's no yes. experimental data yet that can support them. Yeah, for something to be truly scientific, it has to be testable in some way, or at least um, give, or at least allow evidence to be put forth right. to support or, um, yeah. Or, den or deny it. Right. Deny it, yeah. Right. Agreed. Um, Yeah, I think that's about what I wanted to cover for this movie. Um, we're coming up on seven o'clock. So I wanted to ask if there were, well, if you had any questions about the movie or things that you wanted to, or you were curious about. Well, I mean, I th again, I thought it was a great movie and, uh, you know, as actually uh, the comment that I read from uh, Jean Luc Picard, uh, you know, who was one of the Star Trek, uh, played the Star Trek captain, was that this was basically the heroes turned out to be the nerds, you know, yeah. the, who really understood you know, the real quote unquote science, you know, of the science fiction. But it was a tribute to them that they were able to come to the rescue and figure out how to, um, <coughs> you know, get into the center of the ship and figure out what had to be done there. And that was, yeah, that was I wonderful the way they put that together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a, well, well done film, you know, it's be become a real cult 
film, you know, it had, has a lot of staying power. For sure, yeah. But I recommend everybody to see it if they haven't. Definitely. Seen it. Ryan, you still there? Yes. Oh, good. I can't. Hey, I, I just joined. I'm sorry. I totally flaked out just as you're ending this, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. It was with Deb. It's worth, it wasn't quite the same without you, but we, we, we did what we could. But go worth, Ryan did a good job, very good job. So it's worth watching the, uh, when it goes on uh, YouTube, watching it. Okay, okay, okay. I'm so sorry. No, not a uh, problem at all. I have the uh, I have the meeting recorded. Okay. And two but, weeks from now, we're doing Star Trek, the 2009 one. Right, which I just uh, finished watching. Mm -hmm. Is it um, good? It's good. I mean, I've seen it before, but mm -hmm. I think the things to discuss are maybe time travel mm. um but anyway oh look forward to it yes can you give me 25 words yeah. or less on this one sure so um we took a look at galaxy quest um yes and the three um i guess main topics that we covered were yeah wormholes um, yeah if they're if they... theoretically possible uh we looked at where they shot the film uh which was a place in utah called goblin valley uh -huh. where they also uh -huh. shot john carter <laughs> yep. ah really um oh we also took a uh just a brief look at how we can technically hear things in space even though it's a vacuum yeah. And finally, we talked about the possibility of um, finding extraterrestrial life within our within our lifetimes. Uh huh. And okay. the movie did a pretty good job. Um, of course, every sci-fi film has things to pick apart, but right. um, overall, it was pretty well done. So, did you have Deb any uh, comments about the movie? Um, what, I'm remembering that they visualized a wormhole, but called it a black hole. Right? Was that this movie or the next movie? Uh, I think that might have been the ne next. Next. Maybe one. it's it's the next one. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Um, just it was very handy for them to be able to uh propel a uh, rock man out of the yep. uh, starship because you would not want to bring him back home, no, <laughs> or ha have him beating people up on the ship, right? Uh, it was getting, getting a good ally to beat up the bad guys, yeah, yeah. Um, no, no. Well, it's a good film. A, yeah, it is. It, um, it was, uh, I wish the Alan Rickman character had more to say besides just making pickle puss faces, but, mm -hmm. The late, great Alan Rickman. 
Yeah. Yeah. They had a great star-studded cast. Uh, I thought that was. They did. Yeah. 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 Four yeah. or five superstars. So. Yeah. Well done. Okay. Stuart, did you have, uh, did you make any great points? I just tried to add to the points Brian was making. He made some, you know, all those areas. He made some great points. So again, I think it's worth watching YouTube. And I will. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, are you yeah. doing the one in two weeks on uh, Star Trek 2009? Yes, I will be. Yeah. Great. Uh, look forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. I am. Oh, well, you know, I'm personally, but also collectively, sorry that I missed it. So. That's okay. I well, was thinking all about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much. I'm sure I'm sure you muddled through without me, right? Well, you make good comments. So we look forward to two weeks from now on Star Trek. Okay, thank you, thank you, Seward. Yes, you mm. will. Both of you. I'll see you in two weeks. Yes. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Stuart. Bye.